in theory, we all know that worry isn't particularly helpful. In theory, we know that. But I think um, even if I read today's passage that tells you not to worry about your life, that probably both you and I are going to agree with that and still wind up worrying about things. I could read some great quotes that I ran across this week. Leo Buscaglia said, Worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. And I agree with that. I'm sure you probably agree with that. But uh, what are the chances or sometime this week we're still going to end up worrying about something? Montaigne said, My life has been full of terrible misfortunes, most of which never happened. And I think we can relate to that, that, that we're, we're hurt a lot more by our worrying about things uh, oftentimes than what actually happens to us. And we know that at some level, but um, we can wake up worrying about something in the middle of the night. And Montaigne is the last thing we're going to think of. Um, another great quote says, if you want to test your memory, try to recall what you were worrying about one year ago today. Great point, right? It's like uh, we can't remember, even if it was something that completely um, occupied our minds for a period of time. Um, worrying doesn't help us, and yet we find ourselves still worrying. So <clears throat> we're going to look today at this passage where Jesus says, don't worry about your life. And we're going to do it with compassion and understand how hard it is. I think Jesus realized how hard this was. And we're going to look at that saying of Jesus, you worry about so many things, but only one thing is needful. But he doesn't tell us what that one thing is, which is uh, maddening, I think, in some ways. Uh, to say there's one thing you need to focus on, uh, and then you don't get around to saying what that one thing is. Although he's going to say in this passage, seek ye first the kingdom, kingdom, the realm of God, the will of God, and everything else will fall into a line. But even that uh, isn't necessarily helpful. So we're going to try to unpack this passage and see if there's something not only uh, meaningful, but something helpful in what's being said here in our day-to-day -day living, and particularly in the crises in which we find ourselves today. So um, Jesus is going to use a word for worrying that uh, in Greek has a, a very rich meaning, and we might not pick that up necessarily in English. It can mean to be divided within yourself. It can, be mean, it can mean to be pulled in opposite directions, and it can mean to go to pieces. And those are all feelings where you think about things so much, you get lost in this kind of maze that you've built for yourself. Or that the, the struggle of desire against fear, it's almost like you're drawn and quartered. You want different things or you're afraid of different things, but because they're not in harmony, they tear you apart. Um, that, that sense of unraveling can be the most maddening and frightening of, of feelings. I'm going to give you my guess about what Jesus means here, and um, hopefully that will be somehow helpful to your own struggles, because this is something that has to come from inside of you. I think the point that Jesus is trying to make. What is the one thing? If Jesus says there's one thing that's more important than everything else, look at your experience and try to figure out what that is. I mean, any piece of life that you choose, any person, any event, any object, is hypothetical. You're choosing it randomly. You don't know why you're choosing this as opposed to that. And all the religions of the world say there's something else that's different. But I think what the founders of the religion are saying, and this is my guess, and you can just decide how helpful it is to you, that 
the only thing that would make sense to, to be this one thing that's important, uh, the only thing that would make sense to say this is the pearl of great price, sell everything and take that, is it's some version of the whole of things. It's, it's some kind of a sense of the ecology of things. That they're going to talk about the will of God, the kingdom of God, all of these sorts of things. But what it comes down to, when you look at your own experience and you think, okay, well, how, how do I find guidance? What is this one thing that guides me through life? Um, it's how your little life, your personal life, fits in with the universal life, with the large life, with the ecological life. That what we're needing, I think, to understand Jesus is to become ecological in our view of the kingdom. That usually we think of a, a you know king or queen sitting on a throne and kind of ruling it. Everything is a human image. But that's not what Jesus is going to do today. He's going to take the disciples out away from all of the religion and the, the, the business and all of that of their lives and sit them down on a hill. Uh, we, don't, we can't tell whether he's on the hill talking to them or they're up on the hill looking down at him like a kind of baseball stands. But he says, consider the wildflowers. Now think about that for a moment. He, what he doesn't do is say, if you want to know who God is, you want to know what I'm teaching you, consider the Apostles' Creed. Right? Take this home, memorize it, say it every week, and you'll know how to live. Right? I mean, too many churches say that, but that's not what Jesus is saying today. This is a kind of staggering uh, thought, if, if we bring it to mind, that when Jesus is trying to teach people from the very beginning, this is the Sermon of the Mount, this is the first um, that some people are going to hear of his inner thoughts. He says, if you want to understand the sacred and how things work in life, study the wildflowers. Study the birds of the air. How different religion would be if that were our starting place. Not the writings of human beings, not John Calvin, not the different creeds. But the foundation is your life and the experiences that you're going to have. This can sound really naive. <clears throat> Jesus says, consider the birds of the air. Yeah, as long as they're in the air, they're doing fine. But when they get sick and go on the ground, they get eaten. Um, so when Jesus talks about God caring for the birds of the air, that doesn't exclude their death. And in fact, he says this, you know, the, 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 the flowers are so beautiful, these wildflowers. They're the weeds. They're not lilies like on Easter Sunday. They're the, the wildflowers of this area. And Jesus says, Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed like these humble flowers are. And I, I think, but then he says, they're alive today and thrown in the oven tomorrow. So he's not saying they're not going to die. He's not saying that the care of life, uh, the guidance that we find, um, whatever the sacred something is, um, the way it cares for us is not to keep us from dying, but to allow us to manifest, to manifest who we truly are. I mean, when you look at the imagery that he's doing here, and you think of it ecologically, flowers die, birds die. Uh, they have their short span, but within that span, they manifest something that is so glorious that it's, it's worth the, the whole trip. Put this in combination with Jesus teaching that you are the light of the world. And don't just think of some abstract idea of light. <clears throat> For these people, that would be a, a lamp or a candle, something that's being consumed as it gives light. And I think that's important for us to realize that we are like candles. We are like lamps. The life that we have to manifest is a kind of combustion. Right? We, we have a span of which we live. Whatever God's care means, it, it can't mean a rescue from uh, fate, from um, death. 
to my knowledge, everybody that's ever been born has died at some point. So I think what's being said here is um, that that's the way things are. And that is the, um, the way of life, of God, of, of evolution, or whatever, whatever the um, organizational knot you use to pull your experience together. Whatever that is, um, you are an expression of that. And by living your life fully and compassionately, you find your true meaning. Think of it this way. What would safety mean to a candle? Right? Safety wouldn't mean not burning so that it would last forever. Its nature is to be consumed. So Jesus says by trying to hold your life, you lose it. Life is a, a light that's being emitted. Uh, you are like a candle that's giving light to the world. And when you look at flowers, you see that even though their lives may not make sense in some kind of dramatic way, they bring a beauty to the world that is so radiant and so wonderful that it's um, perfection. And you look at the birds of the air, what they're expressing, the songs they sing, um, bring a beauty into the world that is worth the trip. It's not saying that God's going to keep them from being eaten because they are going to be eaten at some point. But that's the way of things. And our true life is ecological. It's within that whole. The one thing that I think uh, is the greatest treasure of all is living in the whole of things. Taking my little life, um, however unfair, and shining that light into the world. Solomon, in all of his glory, was not as radiant as, as a wildflower. The kings and queens of the world are not as radiant as a humble human being who expresses uh, human dignity and human compassion. Jesus also says that, that if you look at the birds of the air, um, they don't work, they don't gather in barns, they don't have factory jobs, they don't... Um, that will get laid off. And I think what he's trying to do is just to step out of the artificial notion of who we are, of where we're getting in life. That's based on our business. And the word that's used there is like busyness. It's um, the kind of uh, storm and tempest that has nothing to do with who we truly are. That most of our worries come from things that are not really us that if we get them, we're not truly happy. And if we lose them, we're not truly destroyed. The, the image I think of this, this idea of worrying, to be divided within yourself, to be pulled in opposite directions, to go to pieces. Another way to understand that is froth. That when you pour Dr. Pepper, or particularly uh, root beer, uh, if you pour it too quickly, it's all bubbles. And theoretically, it's root beer, but you can't taste the root beer. In the same way, your humanity, your life, um, your mind can start chasing itself like a dog chasing its tail. And it creates this kind of a froth inside. And there's nothing you can do to alleviate that except for to let it go. To simply step outside of that view of yourself. To leave your personal life for a moment to remember your large life and then to come back and to give your small life to your large life. One of the great gifts I ever received <clears throat> in terms of wisdom was the first pastor I ever worked with. His name was Joe Owen. He was in San Antonio. Incredibly wise. And one time I was worrying about something what somebody thought of me or something like that. And he said, you can't solve your problems with your stomach. And I, that was such um, a learning for me to come in my own body and realize what I was doing to myself. That instead of trying to think my way or to do what I needed to do, my glands were on overdrive. And it was, it was dividing me, it was pulling me apart. And what he was teaching me is, worry doesn't help if there's something I can fix. I should focus on fixing it if I can, and then if it's not fixable, 
worrying just makes it worse. So um, I think what Jesus is saying is that there is incredible recognition when we're lost in the busyness of our personal lives to step outside of that into nature, in, into the larger life. Look at the flowers. I mean, don't just think about it to go out and experience this river of life, this flowing of life, and realizing that nothing is permanent, that we're all temporary expressions of the one larger life. And that's the way things should be. That's to, to affirm the kingdom, the kingdom, the, the way of life. In some cultures, it's called the Tao, the way, the path, um, the nature of things. That when we're lost in our own worrying, that there's a great peace to be found in stepping out of that story and into this um, rich festival of life that, that's all around us. So Jesus says you're worried about so many things. There's only one thing that you need. I can't know what that answer is for you, but for me, what I think Jesus is inviting us to do is to get in touch with my small life, my heart, the core of my being, and then to put that in harmony with the whole of life, with the river of life, with the ecology of things. And then I don't grieve when flowers die. I recognize their beauty within their impermanence. And I don't grieve when birds die because I understand their beauty takes place, their worth takes place within their impermanence. And then maybe though I grieve when I die, um, I don't lose my heart, my soul, my essence in that because I, I remember I'm part of something deeper and bigger. Think how different religion would be for us if instead of saying, if you want to understand the sacred, study the Apostles' Creed, study John Calvin, study St. Augustine. If instead of that, this incredibly skillful lover of humankind and apparently of life itself invited us to go outside and take a moment to really look at the plants that are there and to see what they are, not why they are, but what they are, and to appreciate that, to see the, the animals around. And maybe in doing that to remember who we are. The, the flowers of the field are here today, gone tomorrow. Jesus isn't saying that they aren't, but he's saying that their ephemeral beauty is an expression of something that is permanent, that this flow of life, the way of things, is to the extent we can tell timeless. It's always been going on, and who knows, but it seems like it will always be happening. And you, uh, yourself, um, life doesn't necessarily um, show fairness to you. Things will happen that are not fair, and you may question your worth. You may worry so much about the future or the past that you can't come into the present moment. You may worry so much about your business that you can't feel truly alive. Um, you may be so um, wrapped up in your own personal story that you can't see the stars, that you can't hear the ocean. Jesus is inviting you out of that worrying physically to go out into the world and take in the fact that you are like these flowers, you are like the birds of the air. You are the light of the world, which doesn't mean that you're not going to die. Your, your very nature is to be consumed But Solomon in all of his glory could not manifest beauty like you can from that humble place. So Jesus did not say that you're a candle that will never burn out. He never said you should hold back your 
uh, light so that you'll last longer. He said, go with it. Give yourself fully to life. Don't try to hold it back. Let your light so shine and you will remember your source. You will remember um, your family of the plants and the animals and life. Your love will become ecological and you will be a light to the world. I invite you now to your own reflection on these words.